All right, it looks like we've uh, slowed down the stream of people coming in, so I think it's a good time to get started. Uh, Marcel, let me know if you can hear us and if you're there. I'm here, and I oh, can hear you. Perfect. All right, well, let me just go through a little bit of housekeeping here. There's Marcelo. Good to see you. Hello. All right. So thank you to everyone that has joined us live or those that will be joining us later via recording. Tonight for our joint Dynamaniacs of Calgary and Dynamaniacs of Edmonton presentation, we bring to you none other than Marcelo Scambolori, the legend, I must say, good friend and awesome presenter. Tonight, Marcelo is going to be talking about Dynamo and its grasshopper equivalent using Rhino Inside Revit. This is some pretty fascinating new technology uh, that I'm very excited to learn about. I know I will be learning here as we get involved for sure. Just before we, we jump in, we are in the Zoom webinar platform, which means the guests have all been muted. Uh, if you have a question, Marcelo loves questions during his presentation, please use the Q&A panel at the bottom. If you type your question into the Q&A panel, I can monitor that, and then we can either answer it at the end, or if it's a, a burning question, I can get uh, vocalize that to Marcelo and he can answer as we're working our way through. So again, if you have questions that if we're working through, hit them up in the Q&A panel. I'll ask Marcelo here inside the video so everyone has access and we'll get them answered. Other than that, that's all I've really got for housekeeping. I, I will say that this will be the last event of the season before we take a little summer break. But be sure to watch the uh, DOC and DOE websites for what's coming up in the future with fall events. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to turn the floor over to you, Marcelo. Let me just stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. All right. Hey. The floor is yours. You Am are up? up. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, awesome. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending, or if you're going to watch later online, however it is. Thank you. Thank you. And Carl, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a very exciting topic, uh, and um, I, um, I'm real excited to present it to a Dynamo user group um, because this topic uh, uh, a lot of times is not seen in the light of Dynamo, and so uh, I'm glad I finally have the opportunity to to talk to Dynamo users and put it in the light of Dynamo. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get going, Carl. Uh, let me see, can I get my screen shared here? Let me see here. Okay, what I, let me see here. Let me see here. Switching screens on me. All right, let me let me uh, share my screen. And then share. Okay, we'll just have to do the preview version. Can you see my uh, presentation? <laughs> we can see it. Now, when I do the when I do the presentation, it kicks to the other screen. So whatever, this is good. Yeah, no worries. Good enough. Good enough, right? Absolutely. Okay, Dynamo and its grasshopper equivalent using Rhino inside Revit. What does that mean? Uh, well. What does it really mean? Carl, let me ask, how long do we get? We got about an hour and a half or so, hour plus? That's right. We we set this to go through till uh, for two hours. We certainly don't need to take all that time if you, you get through that, but we've got lots of time. So give yourself an hour to make sure we get what we got and we can do some uh, question and answers at the end. Okay. So we'll go for about an hour and then we'll have questions and answer. All Perfect. Right. Okay, sounds good. I want to jump in as soon as I can. Uh, what uh, you may have heard this term Rhino inside Revit. I'm not going to get into it a whole lot. Uh, I'm just going to explain it just a little bit. And then uh, so we can really get down to talking about Dynamo and its grasshopper equivalent and what that really, really, really means. Uh, you see the image there. Uh, I'm in the process of writing a book. It was just a Dynamo book, and then this technology hit the ground, and I thought it was so amazing that I decided to actually make a Dynamo reference manual as well as a, um, I'm calling it the Rhino Inside Revit reference manual, although I may be changing the name to Grasshopper for Revit just so it's a little more clear. Uh, anyway, this is a side-by-side -side comparison uh, book 
uh, as a dynamo reference as well as a grasshopper reference. And I'll show you what that means in, in just a minute. Uh, so that's what you see there. The book is coming soon. I'll show you where you can get information about it, you know, and all that. I don't want to get too much into it. Okay. So uh, let's talk about what is Rhino Inside Revit. Uh, okay. So what Rhino Inside Revit is, is uh, let me just go ahead and open Revit. What it is basically is the entire program of Rhino, as well as what comes with Rhino, which is Grasshopper, runs now entirely inside Revit. That's why it's called Rhino Inside Revit. Uh, Grasshopper is a big part of Rhino. Uh, if you're not familiar with Grasshopper, uh, if you haven't heard the term, uh, Grasshopper is a visual programming language, much like Dynamo, although uh, Grasshopper has been around a lot longer. It's been around for about 10 years. Uh, it's very wildly popular. Um, a lot of companies use them, use it, uh, but it's the technology is getting so good now that they stuck Rhino and Grasshopper inside Revit that Grasshopper now accesses Revit. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you some of the functionality for Grasshopper for Revit and how that compares with Dynamo for Revit. And we're just going to run through a few examples uh, and uh, we'll We'll start off slow and then I'll get into some more complicated stuff so that everyone, whatever level you're in, whether you're a beginner Dynamo user or an expert Dynamo user or a beginner Grasshopper user or an expert Grasshopper user or anywhere in between, there'll be something for you. How's that sound? Okay, so uh, Carl, you're going to monitor the questions in case any pop, right? Absolutely. I got my eye on the prize here. If any come okay. up, I'll let you know. Okay, very good. So the way it works uh, as of right now, because I get a lot of questions about this, is uh, how do you get a hold of this technology? Um, right now, you do have to own a license of Rhino 6. Uh, what you see today is technically a beta running off Rhino 7. Although if you have Rhino 6, you can get the Rhino 7 beta for free. And that comes with Revit, Rhino inside Revit. Uh, I tend to call Rhino now Rhinoceros because Rhino and Revit are so darn close. Again, I start flopping them around when I start talking really fast. So I'm going to be calling it Rhinoceros for Revit. Rhinoceros for Revit uh, is a free add-in if you get, uh, if you have Rhinoceros version 7, which is in beta. Rhinoceros version 7 is free if you have a license, a paid license of Rhinoceros version 6. I do believe you could run out and get a demo as well for 30 days. Uh, so that's kind of, that's, that is, that uh, their licenses are relatively cheap, uh, but go check out uh, go check it out. Rhino Rhinoceros is made by the McNeil Company out of Seattle. They do a great job. Uh, Rhinoceros is an amazing 3D modeling program. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> it's nice to see these two worlds kind of collide. Uh, the the issue for a long time, and and what I want everyone to kind of get. Uh, maybe I want to move away from this concept, but the, the, the uh, idea with Rhino inside Revit, I had all these pretty animations and stuff with, with the PowerPoint, but I don't really need them uh, in preview mode. They don't run in preview mode, but whatever. We'll just do a lot of pointing and hand waving. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is interoperability in terms of how do I get my Revit, my Rhinoceros stuff into Revit, and how do I get my Revit stuff into Rhinoceros? We're not going to focus on that today because by what I'm going to show you, you're going to realize that the world is much bigger than just that concept. Although you, you could use it for interoperability. Uh, and in fact, that's the, one of the reasons that McNeil put Rhinoceros inside of Revit is to deal with interoperability. If you have, in fact, a Rhinoceros model, like this one is uh, modeling some surfaces that would look like topography as well as some ramps and so on, you can use Grasshopper as the conduit to get that information into Revit. Now, uh, what you see down there in the picture is not just an unintelligent blob. It is actually real Revit topography. Those are real uh, Revit floors and so on. So Rhinoceros has the ability to use Grasshopper and recreate this geometry in Revit's native language. Uh, so that's a very powerful thing. Although we won't be focusing on that today. I'm going to show you some more, um, some other examples. But anyway, that... That is possible and this technology is, is very powerful uh, in that regard. But before you could even get there, uh, you would have to kind of absorb what I'm saying today, which is uh, understand how Grasshopper works inside of Revit. 
All right, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. And since I'm talking to Dynamo users, uh, right, Carl? We're talking to Dynamo users. Uh, then I'm going to show you Grasshopper and how it can do the same things that Grasshopper does. Uh, so uh, what I'm doing now and what is available for a, a period of time is uh, I have the my draft of the combo Dynamo reference manual and the Grasshopper for Revit reference manual. Uh, and in there is a side-by-side. -side. So basically, um, I'll show you where you could get this uh, so you can preview it. Uh, but basically, it has a side-by-side -side comparison. On the right side is Dynamo, and on the left side is Grasshopper. So the very simple Hello World example in this case, and I won't actually do this, but I'll just show you. Um, you have, this is how you make a Dynamo point, right? The common 0, 0, 0, or in this case, it's 1, 1, 1. And then that's how it would look inside of Grasshopper. Okay, so I'll, I'll get into Grasshopper in a little bit. But anyway, this is the concept of the book, and this is what I'm going to be talking about. How does something work in Grasshopper relative to Dynamo? Uh, okay, so this, this particular example uh, is extracting XYZ components out of a point. Uh, and then how do you build a line out of two points using Dynamo and then using Grasshopper? So there's a lot of equivalents in here. Um, and the book is up to about 140 pages. Uh, and so I haven't quite finished converting all of them over yet, uh, but I'm in, I'm, in the, I'm in the process of doing that. Uh, this could be found uh, if you, if you uh, head over to uh, simplycomplex.org, which, uh, which is a media website that I run. Uh, Carl's involved in the podcast portion of it. Uh, under reference manual, you can look in here. It says coming soon. And under here, it says free uh, check for sample pages. In here is a kind of embedded version of the draft. So you can go through here and, and just have yourself a good time and, and look through it. Uh, okay, so that's available to everyone to take a peek uh, at a later time and kind of see the progress of it. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty. What do you say? Um, so let me show you how it works. So basically, if you're going to use Rhino, if you're going to use Grasshopper for Revit, then you need to open Revit. Just like if you were to use Dynamo for Revit, you need to open Revit. So we're using Grasshopper for Revit. We need to open Revit. Uh, here's a sample file here I'll get into in just a minute. Um, you go to the Add In button here, you click Rhino, and then it'll activate this tab here, which then gives you access to this functionality here. I won't go up into it too much, but Carl, I'll share this presentation so everyone could absorb it a little better. Uh, but just like I like one page summaries, there's a one page summary here on what each one of these icons do. I'll just point out two of them really quick and then we'll get rocking and rolling. Um, one is Rhino, Rhinoceros. You click that, it'll open up Rhinoceros. Uh, Grasshopper, if you click that, it'll open up Grasshopper. So this is Rhinoceros inside Revit, Grasshopper inside Revit. Um, there's actually this one, which is Player, which is a Grasshopper player very similar to Dynamo Player, okay? Uh, and then these are kind of previews. You can preview geometry inside of Revit that is coming from Grasshopper, okay? Uh, that's about it. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to point out, if you are a Rhino or a Grasshopper user, um, then, then the technology you've been using, I now call Rhinoceros outside and Grasshopper outside. When it's within, within Revit, I call it Grasshopper inside and Rhinoceros inside, okay? Uh, one more thing, in the past, when you were using Rhinoceros outside and you wanted to use Grasshopper outside, you needed to open Rhinoceros. Now you can just run Grasshopper and you don't even need to open up Rhinoceros. So for a lot of these examples, we won't even be opening Rhinoceros. We're just going to be opening up Grasshopper, a nice little tech function that is available now that Rhinoceros is inside Revit. Uh, okay, uh, so let's do that. So what you can do here is uh, basically you just fire up Grasshopper. And then this is, an, this is the canvas uh, in there. Um, it has preset functionality. And then uh, this tab is the Revit tab. Uh, this is what all of the Grasshopper for Revit functionality is. Right now, there's only 158 different functions. Um, and so it's not a whole lot because this is still very new. Um, although I'll show you uh, what you do if you don't have the functionality, but you need it uh, a little bit later. Um, because you can code this stuff yourself. And then uh, more and more components are being added all the time. Uh, okay, 
So then here we go. So uh, basically, basically Grasshopper works a lot like Dynamo. I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but I'm talking to Dynamo users. So uh, if you wanted to draw a point, uh, then what you would do is you'd come over to vector and then under here point you would click this which would say construct point Okay, so that looks very similar. In fact, the node does look very similar. This is a node uh, and um, Just like just like dynamo and then it has default values on its input ports Basically, there's zero zero zero. So right now it's creating a point called zero 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 I won't go too much into the grasshopper basics, but this is what's happening. You notice you do not see a point in the background because grasshopper does not have its own geometry background preview like Dynamo. Okay, what if you wanted to see grasshopper's geometry and its background preview? That's what you use rhinoceros for. So you could open up rhinoceros uh, uh, inside and then, then you would see the grasshopper point previewed in rhinoceros okay that's how it works um, this is not a rhinoceros point this is a grasshopper point very similar to dynamo when you build a point in dynamo you are building a dynamo point not a revit point okay so i'm here to emphasize that emphasize that in the first part of the book as you get into it if you kind of turn to the front page um, you'll see here that uh, basically uh, when you build a point in Dynamo, yeah, you are building Dynamo geometry. Revit geometry is blank, similar to when you do it with Grasshopper. Revit geometry is blank. Here, Grasshopper geometry previewed in Rhino. Now, there's a way to get it from Grasshopper to Rhino. You do something called bake, and you may have heard that term bake. That's going to come full circle in Revit because the terms you start to use to get geometry from rhinoceros to Revit is you use the term bake. It's very, it's a very grasshopper kind of centric way of talking. But anyway, it's the way to kind of push geometry around. So that's that's that. Okay, so you kind of see that it's very similar uh, in that regard. Uh, and uh, and so here is the here's the preview, and then you go back and um, here is the grasshopper interface. Uh, and then if you want to. Um, you could add points in here. I won't go too much into it. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Holy smokes. Um, there's sliders. They have sliders. They have, you know, a bunch of other things like that. But you can wire this up and, you know, have yourself a party. I won't go into too much of that. Book has a lot of that uh, in detail. Uh, but it is very, very parametric and so and in that regard. Okay. So basically, you see boxes, which does the functionality. And you see wires at which... Uh, information is flowing just like Dynamo. Uh, I know people would argue that it's not just like Dynamo, but for this particular example, in concept, it is these are input ports, that's an output port on the right, uh, and so on. Okay, good. So we got the basics down. Let's start getting into some more complicated examples. How's that sound? Any questions yet, Carl? Because I'm ready to rock and roll. Nothing yet. We're all, everyone's mesmerized so far. So nah. but they, they'll come as you start getting more that, out of the. Is that the term we use, mesmerized? Okay. I'm so, going to say uh, so. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pull out a very classic example and then we'll walk through it very slowly. Um, let me go ahead and try to figure out what the best way to do here is. Maybe we, maybe we scoot ahead in the book. Uh, okay. So, so basically the book has. Uh, how to do how to do points, lines, surfaces, uh, solids. How to put points on solids, you know, so on. I'm not going to go into all that. You can see that. How do you put points? How do you put points in diagonal to a surface? How do you spread them distributed evenly? I won't go into all that. Um, but uh, it's it's all here in the fundamentals of of how you do that. Okay, so I'm I'm moving ahead to the first Revit interface. Um, there's also a bunch of stuff on how do you make syntax, range syntax, how do you, how do you make a, a series of lists? That's all in here. Um, what is a list? Uh, what's a nested list? Uh, Dynamo uses, uh, Grasshopper uses something called trees. Uh, don't let that term scare you though. Uh, they really physically are trees, uh, but don't let that scare you. Um, you know, this is... This is basically a list according to a nested list according to Word. That's a nested list according to Dynamo. That's a nested list slash tree according to 
grasshopper. So the, the structure and the concept's not too hard to, to, to grasp, in uh, my opinion. Um, you're looking at the final version, but it took me a while to kind of get, <laughs> get to my point, but anyway, I'm happy to summarize it for everybody. Um, okay, total math functions and so on. Okay, let's, let's scoot ahead to one of our first Revit examples where, where Grasshopper interacts with Revit. And this is a classic example. Um, I taught this example on the right, um, holy smokes, five, five, six years ago, uh, Carl, six years ago. Uh, this was kind of the uh, uh, inflection point where a lot of people started learning uh, grass uh, dynamo. <laughs> so I thought I'd bring it back and show everyone how to do it in the grasshopper equivalent. Now, let me, let me put something out there for the listeners. And when you listen at home later, um, the question is why if, 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 if grasshopper for Revit can do the exact same thing as Dynamo for Revit. Why would I need to learn Grasshopper for Revit for this particular example? Why would I ever need to do that? Well, first of all, my opinion, why not? Um, you know, I, I, I never, me personally, I've never let that, those kind of things slow me down. Um, back in 20, 2009, I built an elephant inside of Revit and, um, um, you know, th those kind of questions came up again. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, well, why do you want it? Well, why not, first of all? But anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's, so, you know, in my opinion, you know, if someone has those kind of questions, don't ever let that slow you down. But I can think of some good examples of why you would want to do this. Um, as you think about interacting with the Rhino database, now you may not use Rhino, Rhinoceros inside your office, but maybe you will in a client, maybe you have a friend and so on. Um, I came up with a little graph. I actually drew it as you were doing the intro, Carl. Um, is, is basically this. Let's say, for example, my book teaches concepts, sometimes big concepts, but I leave it up to the user to, to take these concepts and plug them in other places. So, so if this particular example is getting and setting parameters, then I expect that to be part of a larger graph or a larger program that you're writing. Um, so you can think of this scenario. If, say, for example, um, you had a Rhino model which you needed to extract elevations from, say, floor slabs that were built inside of Rhino. Well, if you didn't know how to do, do it using Grasshopper for Revit, then the only way to do it was you'd have to kick that information down maybe to Excel or memorize it in your head and then push that information back into Dynamo. Well, if you know the equivalent way to do it in, in Grasshopper for Revit, well, then it's just a direct shot right in. Boom. You can just take that Rhino information and push it right into Grasshopper and then right into Revit. So it's a much du more direct route. Um, I find I use this all the time. So think about that. Think about the roundabout way. If you're using Rhinoceros, think about the roundabout way you'd have to use it if you're not using Grasshopper um, versus if you could be using Grasshopper. So just let that settle in, and then I'll head back to my example here. Um, and so what in this particular example, what we're going to do is we're going to take the bottom of the walls here in this example, and we're going to get the bottom of the elevation. Then we're going to take these columns and we're going to change the parameter of the columns so that they match the bottom of the wall. So that's what we're going to do in this particular example. Now, you may not have a wall, you may not have a column, but you may have some parameter and another parameter and you need them to equal and match each other. Well, you can use that example for that, okay? Um, and say, for example, if, you, if the bottom of the wall maybe is defined by something inside of Grasshopper, like a floor slab or whatever, um, then you can pull that information in as well. Although I won't focus on that much any, uh, right now, but I'm gonna show you how to do this with the Grasshopper equivalent. If you're not familiar how to do it with Dynamo, there it is, six nodes, boom, boom, boom. Okay, get and set the very, very famous get and set parameters. Di uh, Grasshopper for Revit also has equivalent get and set parameters. The only thing that's a bit different is how you select things out of Revit. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's do it. Okay. So basically if we look at the wall and we look at the parameter of the wall, what we need to get is the base offset of the wall. And, and uh, I hope uh, Carl, 
and the listeners could forgive me for my uh, imperial units, but we are imperial <laughs> units for this example. Not every example has imperial units, but uh, uh, this one does. Okay, so uh, forgive me for that. That's 11 point, let's just say 11, six units. How's that sound? 11, that six units. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, and we need to read that value. Then if we look at the columns here, we see that they're at a different base offset value. So then we basically need to set the column parameter value of base offset to, to the base val offset value of the wall. Okay, so I'll show you how to do that. So we basically select the wall, get the, get the, base, param get the uh, base offset parameter value. Then we select all of these columns and then we set it to that value. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So I like to walk that through in my head because that's how I actually program the nodes. So the first thing we need to do is select the wall, yeah? So we fire up Grasshopper. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this. Okay, and let's do that. So how do we select something out of Revit? If we go into this params uh, thing here, you're not gonna remember all the picks and clicks. So like I said, please Please reference the book afterwards. Um, the little preview I have, and it'll be, everyone's by the way, everyone's asking when it's going to be out uh, because I, it was going to be. A, now that I'm doing the the grasshopper equivalent, uh, it's looking more like towards the end of summer. Um, but anyway, uh, if uh, okay, so here we go. So basically, uh, if you wanted to select something out of rhinoceros, you'd go to param and you'd go under this geometry, and you you'd select something out of rhinoceros, but since we're selecting something out of Revit, we're taking Revit and we're converting it to grasshopper geometry. Then we go to this tab, Revit. We call this one graphical element, so we use that. So this is very similar to the select model element node in Dynamo, okay? So um, with grasshopper, it's a little more interactive. So uh, you right click here and you say set one Revit graphical element. And graphical element's a little misleading because it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like a graphical element or a 3D element. It could be like a dimension or something, but anyway. And then we go to Revit and then we select the wall. Uh, let's see, did it work? Let's do it again. Maybe I was talking too much, Carl. Okay, and we select the wall. How do you know? Um, they have some, an equivalent thing like a watch node. It's called the panel. Although the panel is a very powerful multi-use uh, entity, I'd call it. Um, and then you can wire that up and it'll show you, okay, yeah, you've got the wall. Okay, so that we got the wall. All right, now that we got the wall, um, what we need to do is we need to get the base offset value. So if we go into parameters, we go into Revit. By the way, these are all out of the box. Everything here is out of the box. So, so if you were to get uh, Grasshop, uh, if you were to get Rhino inside Revit right now, you would have all this functionality available to you. I'm not using any special adding um, components or extra um, what we would call packages in Dynamo. They're called components in, uh, in uh, Grasshopper. So these are all out of the box. Okay, so hold on, Carl. I gotta move some stuff around here. Okay, so what we do is, um, okay. So what you do is you come over to element. The organization, by the way, uh, for for the Revit tab, the Grasshopper for Revit tab is very different than Dynamo for Revit, very. So you would just need to get familiar with where things are, but I, I, can, I can point you in a bit of the right direction here. So under, under element here, you would see there's a get and a set parameter. So I'm gonna grab a get, and then I'm gonna grab a set because I know I'll need to use it in a little bit. Okay, so there's the set, there's the get, right? So it's kind of plug and chug, right? So here's element. So this would go into element. Okay, we're getting the parameter. So we're gonna get, remember, the base offset value of the wall. Okay, and if you need to, you can, um, you can group this a lot like demo. And you can right click and you can name the group. So I'm gonna say, uh, I don't know, gets, uh, gets wall, right? So this gets the wall, just so we're kind of following along. Here's the element. Now it says parameter key. That's a little bit, that's a very uh, API way of calling this, but it's basically the parameter name slash key, parameter name. And what is it? It was, uh, it's always good to kind of take a peek back. It was 
base offset capital B space capital O, all, all case sensitive and space sensitive. I don't know if that's a term, Carl, space sensitive, but uh, anyway, there it is. Okay, there's a lot of ways you, okay, so now we're gonna add text here. What is basically a string? Uh, there's a lot of ways you can add a string. Uh, you can actually use your very handy panel will work just fine. If you type in text into a panel, you don't have to put it in quotes. It'll just know that it's, that it's uh, what it's meant for because it's smart enough when it gets wired into the input port, it can kind of do its own internal check on what it really needs to be. So in this case, we can say base space offset like that. And that is good enough. We'll wire it and we'll, once it turns gray, that means some action has happened. You can roll over it just like it output port in Dynamo and it'll say, I have pulled my value. I'm just gonna continue to reuse this panel. So I'm gonna pull it there and it's gonna say, ah, oh, I have pulled, I have got, I have got the base offset value. Okay, super cool, super easy peasy. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay, so now next what we gotta do is we got to set the columns to this value. So we need to we need to get all the columns of that type. So this is where it gets a little different uh, with Grasshopper versus Dynamo, but it's okay. It's, you know, it's all good. It is what it is. Um, so basically what we need to do is is if, you, if you're not gonna select by single, and basically you could select by multiple. So this is kind of like the equivalent um, select model element or select model elements, plural, in Dynamo. Uh, you could use either one to do that. So I could select all the columns um, but uh, manually, but I'm not gonna do that. I'll show you how to do it based on getting all the instances of that family type, which would be that column type. So let's go back and look and see. Uh, this column type is concrete square column 30 by 30. Um, okay, so imperial units in inches, I guess there. So anyway, th 30 units, Carl, it's 30 units, 30 by 30 units. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's what we need to look for. Uh, and then this is in the structural column category. So what you do with Dynamo, uh, excuse me, what you do with Grasshopper, goodness, is you start, you start up and then you work your way down and you stop wherever you want. So if you only want the category, you stop at category. If you only want the types, you stop at types. If you only want the instances, you stop at instances, although I don't think you can go any further than that. So basically we need to get the category first, which would be structural columns, not just columns, right, Carl? Um, so in order to do that, we go under input and then model category picker. Uh, because Grasshopper is a bit more user interactive, uh, it has these concepts called pickers and interaction and so on. So this is the picker. They call it the picker. Basically, you'll roll this down until you find your, uh, your category. Uh, this is one way to do it. There are other ways to select uh, the category, but this is one way to do it. This is the one I typically will, will do here. So here's the structural column, okay? And then next, we basically need the element type picker, which means we need to pick the element type out of that category. It's just, it is, it's just, it just is what it is. So now it's going to say, okay, this picker is going to tell you everything that's in this picker, basically, right? So this says structural columns. So here we're just going to roll down till we see the 30 by 30. Okay. Now we can't just wire that right in because that's a type and this is looking for an element, which is basically the instance. Yeah. So we can't just wire this right in. Don't do that. Okay. We need to actually get all the instances of this type. Okay. So uh, uh, Grasshopper uses um, like a filtering system. Um, it's not too complicated to understand, but under filter, um, basically, um, basically you need a type filter. Um, and let me, okay, I'll back up. Let me explain this. Because you're selecting all of the instances that exist within the entire project, then you have to go to document. And under there, um, you go under document uh, elements, okay? 
So this says, okay, I'll give you all the elements within the document if you tell me what you're looking for by the filter. So in that case, then your filter would be types. Best way to explain it. Okay, so types is filter, so you can feel that in, and then we feed that in. Okay, there we go. And if you, if you kind of missed everything I said, just, just copy and paste this around and just change these around and you'll be A-OK. -okay. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna group this together and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say uh, select, select, select by, uh, by type, all uh, elements. Okay, cool. So if you kind of missed everything I said, what you can do is just copy this thing around. You can actually copy this and paste it into another grasshopper definition, and then just change these around to your heart's desire, and you'll be able to get uh, anything by type. Okay, so <sighs> ready to get going? So we need to set those columns. So now we can wire this up. Now we've got all the columns selected. The parameter key would then just be the base offset because in the columns, that is the same. If you look here, base offset, yeah, cool. And then we just have one more thing we need to wire up. Now, this is like a watch node, but you would not do this, okay? That's a very dynamo thing of doing. The panel is very smart, but very unintelligent at the same time. I'm gonna get in trouble for saying that, Carl. Uh, but what typically will come out of here is a string, sort of. So if you try to wire this in here, it's not gonna work because it's not equivalent. You need to pull it directly out of its source. So I'm just gonna go there, boom, and that should do what it did. And then somehow we see something that says, oh, uh, it's at, it's, there's a little there, it says the structural foundations will be moved with the column, which is okay, uh, because you are getting a little message and you can see that it has changed. There you go. So that is the grasshopper equivalent of how to get in set these parameters. So if you need a summary of this, it is right here in the book. So that's what we just did, right? We went and we got the wall, we got the base offset value, we selected all the types of that column, and then we plugged and chug and bang, bang, it set it. Not too bad? Not too bad. So a quick question, if you go back yeah. to the grasshopper graph. Okay, uh, yeah. Script, so I it, think we're supposed to be calling it a script. Script, okay. I think we're supposed <laughs> to be calling it a script, uh, but go ahead. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just entrenched to say graph when I talk about Me Dynamo. Too. But the, the question is, inside of Dynamo, there's, there's certain colors. So if there's a, a gray node, it's good. If it turns dark gray, you know that it's right. If there's a yellow uh, node, it's bad. If there's a red node, it's really bad. Um, what are the colors that we see here in the screen indicate in relation to that? Okay, it looks like um, this is a general um, this is a general warning. This orange color. Okay. Um, and so sometimes warnings are acceptable. Like in this case, it's saying the Dynamo the Dynamo API is saying that the column the the foundations are coming with the columns. So anything down the line associated with that is going to turn that color to say, hey, listen, there is a warning coming out of Revit. Please take a look at it. Um, so that's basically that warning, uh, usually not too bad when you're working with the Revit database. If you see the orange, it's usually a, it's, it's, eh, it's an FYI. Yeah. It's, usually it's, it's it, like if you're, if you're lining things up, it may say, um, it may say, uh, uh, like for example, we're talking about structural beams, they may, structural beams have, are no longer, um, you know, parallel or, you know, whatever, whatever kind of thing that, that you may think that a message may pop up. Uh, they could be, these are basically warnings. So when you see the yellow, that means that Revit has popped a message up, uh, giving you a warning. So the warning could be extreme. You know, you may think like element needs to be deleted for whatever reason. I don't know, but, but it's always good. If it turns orange, take a little peek and then, um, and see what it's, see what it's all about. Um, uh, so that's what that, that's what that color means. There is a red, there is a red warning. Uh, it just means that it hasn't, it hasn't run and it needs information. Um, so if you want to disconnect a wire, you can go like this and say, disconnect. So I'm going to disconnect this. I'll try to run this and we'll see if we'll break it. Um, sometimes these turn red if, if you need, uh, if you're trying to fill in, uh, information, I'm trying to think of like certain scenarios at which, uh, 
at which one ones that don't have like default values uh, I'm just trying to think these all have default values but you know the, it, the thing will turn red sometimes on you and it just means you gave me you gave me either you didn't give me enough information or there's a tight mismatch that's about gotcha. the best I can explain I, I'm sure there's a lot more warnings but that's the ones I've ran into in terms of interacting with the Revit database fair enough and the talking about the the, mm -hmm. the panels are just yellow is just the color of panels. The color of panels are yellow. Yes, nice. they, are. they are. They are yellow. Yep. 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 And when you make Perfect. a copy of it, for some reason, the panel name goes away, but, but yeah, they are just yellow. That is, yeah, I know yellow uh, sometimes gets us nervous, but, uh, but not in grasshopper. Yellow, yellow just means panel. Yeah. All right. We could write cool. a PhD dissertation <laughs> on on all the functionality that a panel has. So, um, I, I and you know, I, quite honestly, going through um, learning the equivalence of Dynamo and Grasshopper really opened my eyes to how Grasshopper works internally. I can show you all this, but really, the best way to learn is to try it. Um, because, like for example, I don't, I'm not getting going to get too off course here, but but let's say for example, uh, we want to build a point. Well, you can do that, but let's say, for example, you wanted to, you wanted to actually uh, build a vector. Well, a vector um, will actually take X, Y, Z components just like a point. So you could feed in information to it. You can feed it in here. Um, and so like there's, there's a lot of instances where things are a bit loose in terms of how they're defined when Dynamo is very rigid and things won't work unless unless they're uh, unless they fall under a certain rule and i can't really think of any rules that get broken with 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 dynamo but with grasshopper things become a little more loose in certain areas uh, one certainly would be the panel another would be kind of working with vectors and that type of information um, so anyway that's i don't know how we ended up there but that's just a for, <laughs> for instance by the way if we're talking about colors too um colors can be changed on uh on the um on the uh, groups as well, yeah. So, I if, feel free to play around with that. Um, I want to mention another thing. If you're a if you're a if you're a seasoned grasshopper user, you use extra components all the time. Um, this is just a few that I have: human, human UI, um, kangaroo. There's wombat. Um, actually, I'm working on mine right now, which is called Simplex, which actually does have the moose in it. Um, I guess we have to show the moose for the for the here it is the moose for the uh for the audience of course because we teased it um but basically if i get back to uh gra if i get back to rhino you don't see it because it's in rhino right so if i go back to rhino here's rhino there's the moose right there that's the moose that's actually not a rhino moose that is a grasshopper moose right there so That's if I correct. wanted to make it, if I wanted to make it to rhino geom rhinoceros geometry, I would have to go back to grasshopper. I could right click here and click this button called bake. And then uh, you can put it on whatever layer you want and so on. And then it actually builds it into, it builds it into rhinoceros. And now, now it is the rhinoceros moose. So there you go. Um, had to show the moose, Carl. I had to show the moose. Very well done. Moose. Yeah. So, uh, so did you see how snappy that was, Carl? Uh, I it was you definitely a lot more uh, snappy, as we'll say, than if we did that same thing in Dynamo. Yeah. Oh, and look, by the way, by the way, um, grasshopper geometry is previewed in Revit. Uh, and so here you see, here you see the grasshopper moose inside of now I have to use different rotating methods because I'm in Revit. Uh, in, in Revit, see, there it is. Uh, now you can turn that off if you like. Um, there, you can turn it off here or you can leave it on shaded or go wire or, or whatever. But, but actually, I found this to be very helpful. I was originally against this idea of previewing grasshopper geometry in Revit. Uh, but I find it quite helpful because uh, what this allows you to do is to geolocate themes from rhinoceros into into Revit, so it's it's extremely helpful. Like, where do these things, excuse me, grasshopper and rhinoceros into Revit? Like, where is this really going to land within my model? And it's it's um, rhinoceros being the three D modeling program it is. 
uh, is very conscious of its origin and its geospace, geolocation, when in fact Revit is, that is conscious, but is not as transparent as it probably could be. So, uh, so, so it's good to, to I, I personally like to have the preview, quite honestly, yeah. Okay, good enough? Well explained, and we got to see the moose, so I'm happy. Yay, okay. Okay, so I think we can move on to another example. What do you say? Sounds good. Let's okay, do it. So we talked about 3D modeling. Let's talk about um, let's talk about like annotation. Um, okay, so let's talk about annotation. Let's talk about annotation. If we look at the if we look at right now what's available with Grasshopper and Revit. Uh, like I said, there's only 158 components, and none of these actually are annotation. They all deal with um, they all deal with 3D geometry. So that's kind of where the focus is right now. Although Dynamo is the same way. I, I can't remember how long it took. It took years for for um, for like tags and text notes to get into uh, into Dynamo. Um, now you could use the a package to help you, right? But but in in any case, uh, there is ways to deal with annotation, uh, and so I'm going to show you. Let me show you um, here how how you can um, use annotation, uh, basically, and how you can how you can work with annotation because I know that's that's also a big part big part of of uh, of what we need to do. So. Um, Let's say, for example, let's take, uh, let's go back to the book. I like to reference the book, Carl. Um, by the way, these, I'm in the process of indexing all this, and that is a, quite the chore um, because uh, I have to index every name, but also every node, uh, kind of like a cookbook. So that's, uh, that's, that's fun. Um, let me mention it now, and then we'll get into it if we have time. If, for example, you don't have something out of the box with a functionality that you would like to have with Grasshopper for Revit, you could make your own functionality. Uh, and so this example here kind of points that out. This is a bit more complicated, but uh, in this example, it's basically taking a beam and it's move, physically moving it to a location that's offset from the edge of a slab, okay? That's what Dynamo can do because Dynamo has this set element location node. Okay. Grasshopper does not, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. So basically what, in this example, you can put down a C sharp script node and you could code your own set element set location node. And that's what this does. And then basically you get the same results. Okay, so that's what, that's what this is. We'll do an example later if we have time, but we'll just do like pulling text, not something a little more complicated like this. But anyway, you have the ability to do that. Uh, and it's really not that difficult uh, to do. Okay, so I'm cruising on over to our next example. Yeah, and hopefully if we have time, we'll do this one where we get text. Okay, but anyway, let's cruise over to um, one of my favorite examples, which is uppercase. So uh, you have the ability to change things to uppercase. Uh, so if you have an office that has a standard, let's do this one, rooms. So for example, these room names um, are in uppercase, but if they are lowercase and you need to change them to uppercase, uh, Grasshopper allows you to do that. Now, I'm not going to put all these nodes down just because we went through these basics. Okay, Carl? Uh, I'm just going to show everybody here so we can move on. But, but I do want to talk about annotations. So so basically this case you have all the room names yeah and you need to turn them to uppercase okay so what you do basically is do you remember how we selected all the um we selected all the types out of the category well in this case you want to select all the rooms so you would select all the elements out of category basically so basically you would get the the uh the the, the uh, category picker and you would select rooms and instead of the type filter you'd use a category filter and then boom, through document elements, that gets every single room on the project. And then basically you just need to get the name parameter of, out of the room element, yeah? 
and then you basically send it through this thing, which is change text to uppercase. It actually changes it to lowercase. It can do upper or lower. Um, so, you know, there it is. It can do upper or lower. And then uh, here's what it looks like to upper. And then basically you just set that text back to those original elements, that original parameter name, and then the new uppercase. And then boom, everything turns to uppercase. Okay, so it's very, very similar. Uh, in that regard. Yeah. So another question could be, well, why would you use this if Dynamo can do the same thing? Well, I can think of a lot of reasons. Actually, a lot of Grasshopper users use something called Elefront, uh, which basically makes Rhinoceros a bit more BIM-ish. And there's information contained within Rhinoceros elements, like names and, and, and dimensions and all this stuff. So if you needed to pull, if these rooms outlines maybe were drawn inside of rhinoceros and you needed to extract the names out of out of rhinoceros um, that's what you'd be putting in here uh, and so you can connect this right up to rhinoceros um, because you know maybe that information is coming from rhinoceros and anyway it's a good way to kind of see how these things work um, now one more thing too is if grasshopper for revit can do everything that dynamo can do for revit then what does that mean for the future of Dynamo? Well, Dynamo is going to always be here because Dynamo, what, what, what Grasshopper for Revit is trying to solve is the interoperability issues. So you could use Grasshopper for Revit for your interoperability issues working with Rhinoceros, and then you use Dynamo for Revit when you're only working with Revit for your documentation, all your all your annotation, all your, your other modeling, all that sort of thing. So, so think of the left side as connecting to, rhin to rhinoceros and think of the right side as connecting to, to Revit. Uh, that's kind of a way of, of thinking about it. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't think that Grasshopper for Revit will ever get to the point that has as much functionality as, as Dynamo for Revit, but, but we'll see. Uh, although they do really serve two very different purposes. Uh, if that makes any sense to you. But if, you're, if, if you want to change text to uppercase and you're not dealing with the rhinoceros database and you feel more comfortable with Grasshopper, you could use just Grasshopper for Revit. You wouldn't need to open Dynamo and, and do this, but you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give more options to people and leave it up, leave it up, to, leave it up to you. Okay, so that's kind of well, how I, you do the text. That's kind of how you do some annotation. Um, Maybe I'll save it for last because we'd have to do some coding. Um, maybe what I'll do, how are we doing on time, Carl? Another 10 minutes? Yeah, we, we're doing good. And, and while you're, you're sort of deciding what the next um, thing is, I think you brought up a good point about the interoperability because Dynamo is essentially free with Revit. So if you're using Revit, you need to use visual programming, you have access to Dynamo. If you're using Rhinoceros, Grasshopper is essentially free with Rhinoceros, so you use that program. But there's going to be times whether you're switching jobs or moving between companies or not enough licenses that you need to use one or the other. And while we're, we're presenting to a, to a Dynamo user group and we're sort of showing the functionality of uh, Rhino, Rhino inside of Revit and Grasshopper inside of Revit, really, especially your, your, your book here, could be a great resource for people working the other way. They spent time in school working with Grasshopper and with Rhino. They get to a, a job in a firm that doesn't have licenses for that. Um, they understand the workflow inside of Grasshopper. Now they have a way to say, well, Dynamo is the same, but very different. How do I do that? This would be a sort of a great reference for that. So I know we're doing in the context of Dynamo people learning Grasshopper, but I think this works both ways. And I think that's what's going to make it such a great reference once it gets out there. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you, Carl. Um, if anybody is a seasoned Grasshopper user, I'll guarantee you, you will learn something new about Grasshopper. If you look at this particular node, this one's brand new. This is called a filter mass picker. Um, it's brand new in Grasshopper. Brand new. So uh, basically, uh, it's a UI for selecting things out of a list. You can basically click this, a check mark will come here, and then it basically selects. Uh, this is brand new. Um, so if you are a seasoned Rhino 6 user, uh, if you're a seasoned Grasshopper 6 user, then you would have learned something new by seeing this. I use this one all the time, actually, uh, to help kind of select things and filter things. 
uh, really super neato and cool. Okay, so we are cruising over. Um, here is an awesome example that I don't have time to go into, but this is one thing that gets me very excited about rhinos, uh, grasshopper for Revit, which is dealing with DWGs and interoperability with DWGs. Rhinoceros does a very good job with opening and using DWGs. Revit doesn't do a very good job with opening and using DWGs. So if you need to get information out of a DWG, and in this case, we're building a grid from a DWG into Revit, the conduit at which you can pass it through would be Rhinoceros and Grasshopper. And it's really simple and slick. Um, so here is the equivalent with, with, uh, with using um, Dynamo. And then here it is with, with Grasshopper. And it gives you a lot more functionalities with pulling layers and being more stable. Uh, in fact, if, this, if I had room for another five or more nodes, I could even take the actual text from this DWG and I could actually assign it to the grid. So uh, because Rhinoceros and Grasshopper are so compatible with the DWG, you have the ability to use a lot of that. Uh, so this is very exciting to me. In fact, I have, I have used this uh, functionality a lot, DWG to, to Revit um, through Grasshopper and Rhinoceros inside. Um, so it was, it was very helpful. We had this, uh, what I had, <laughs> let me tell you, we actually had an a, a AutoCAD file that had over 20,000 text, uh, uh, M texts. If anyone's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really good with well, AutoCAD. Carl, you could help me. 20, almost 30,000 points uh, that had a piece of text on it. And the piece of text basically represented a load for mechanical. So it like, it was a five or a 10 or a four. And they were all geolocated. Well, I used this technology to actually take the text value and extract the geolocation and assign it uh, inside of Revit. Uh, that would have been a major pain uh, to do it any to do it other ways. So, so this is nice that that uh, this kind of gets to come into the fold as well. Now, I know there are some packages in Dynamo that do this, but they just don't have the history that. Rhinoceros does with DWGs. In fact, Carl, I have a little dirty secret. Whenever I look at a DWG, I don't open it in AutoCAD. I open it in Rhinoceros. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's go. Fam, da, 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 da. Uh, Carl, I got sidetracked. I forgot where I was going. We were going to the, <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I know where I'm going. Topo, Topo. Um, yes, who likes Topo? Uh, <laughs> I don't believe I'm going to lay this down, but I, I will run through it really quick. Uh, basically, uh, this particular example, um, in this particular example, I love this example. Uh, what, what this example does is it shows um, that there, here it is in Dynamo as well. Um, there are property lines inside of Rhino. Uh, gosh darn it, I'm doing it again. <laughs> there are property lines that are inside of Revit that are two dimensional. And you can't see them on your topography because they're two dimensional. Well, you can use, you can basically use um, Grasshopper to, to extract those property lines and project them onto topography. And then um, also a little added step here was um, we basically took, uh, took the property lines and put fence posts at equal spacing all the way around. Um, so I'll, I'll step through that in a second. Um, but, but what is really nice about using rhinoceros and grasshopper is because it works so well with DWGs, it also works very, very well with meshes and it has a very, very robust mesh modeling system. Uh, and so, uh, so, so it's kind of think about that too, is about some of the options that you may have. So if you, if you look at, at Rhinoceros, uh, it has an entire mesh modeling section and repair tools and so on. And so does Grasshopper. And so if you're working with mesh, what's the only object in Revit that's a mesh uh, that's out of the box? <laughs> you could import it, right? Is, a, uh, is topography. I think that's correct. I think it's the only one. Carl, I think so. Topography is the only mesh object inside of 
Revit that could be natively built with the Revit tools. Uh, so, so if you're going to work with topography, it is really, really, really helpful to, to use uh, the Grasshopper for Revit technology because it's very stable when it works with meshes. Yeah, so basically, uh, this is an example where um, it's projecting it to meshes. Now, you could say, well, Dynamo does the same thing. It does, but, but the thing is with Dynamo, if you want to work with a mesh, you have to actually convert it to a poly surface first and then work with it because Dynamo uh, doesn't work very good with meshes. There are mesh tools in Revit. Uh, they are not as robust as, uh, as, uh, as they are with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Grasshopper. Plus, um, a lot of the functionality that is available in Dynamo uh, doesn't work with meshes, so like intersections, offsets, things like that. So if you convert it to a poly surface, then you can do that. Uh, in Grasshopper, you can just natively work with the mesh element. So in this particular case, basically what we do is we take the property lines, project them up, um, you do an intersection between the two meshes, and then basically what you can do is you can then um, take, uh, in this case, basically what we did was then we took uh, fence posts and put them at equal spacings. So we took the curve and then we put them, put equal spacing points on them. This is this divide length uh, is very similar to the uh, point at parameter along a curve, hey Carl? Uh, and so in this case, uh, it's divide length, although divides a mis is, you know, it's misunderstood. It just means that you're putting points along a curve, not that you're physically dividing it. Um, and then you put the points on there. You can feed that into this particular node, which is a grasshopper for Revit node. Uh, this one will add a family instance based on the point. So very similar to, uh, to Dynamo. Uh, and then basically I'm selecting all of this particular family, which is that wire fencing. It's just basically one post with a point. And then it places it down all along those points there. And what's nice here too is if you change the topography in Revit, that'll change the mesh that is in Grasshopper, which would then change the intersections, which then would modify the locations of your property line and your, uh, your fence posts here. Yeah. So, okay, there you go. So I think, uh, I, Carl, I'm glad I showed this because I think it's good showing the power too of, the, of be able to work with mesh. Very helpful when using Grasshopper for Revit. And like I said, not that it can't be done. Just got to do a little, some gymnastics if you want to use the Dynamo version. <laughs> Um, okay. How did I end up here? Ah, so <laughs> scale, I don't know. These Corinthians, uh, by the way, the book is going to come with an extensive database. Uh, and so you'd be able to have access to all that, including this Corinthian column, uh, this Corinthian column I built inside of Revit. Um, and you can see here too, uh, as what, what uh, okay. So, uh, inside of Revit, basically here it is, here we are. Hey, there's the moose again. Uh, <laughs> basically, in order to work with Revit geometry in Grasshopper, it has to be converted to Grasshopper geometry. Just like if you want to work with Revit geometry in Dynamo, it has to be converted to Dynamo geometry. Well, so far I haven't found any conversion issues. So one test I ran was on this Corinthian column inside of Revit. Yeah, this was built inside of Revit, Corinthian column. How does that convert into grasshopper geometry? And it looks pretty good. Uh, here's the example. Yeah, I didn't see any degradation or, or tussellation or anything like that. Um, so it comes in really nice. Um, Dynamo does a good job too. This is Dynamo. Yeah, so this grasshopper. So anyway, so just kind of show you converting geometry doesn't seem to be an issue. Uh, the moose converted just fine. Um, uh, I built a rhinoceros in Revit that converted just fine. So, so those usually aren't issues. And the reason they're not issues is because, because Grasshopper and Rhinoceros is a very robust modeling program. Grasshopper and Rhinoceros work in uh, their formulations for surfaces is something called NURBS surfaces and NURB modeling. Uh, and so it's very powerful. Uh, Revit, if you want to talk about its modeling engine, if you were using the mass or adaptive, that is something called Hermite splines and Hermite formulations, which is, um, it's another version of uh, splines, but it's not, um, it's not as, as complicated as, as the NURB or as more as robust. Although to the naked eye, if you looked at a surface in Revit and a surface, a, a Hermite surface in Revit and a, 
and a, and a NURB surface in, in grasshopper slash rhinoceros. From the naked eye, you couldn't see the difference. Um, it's just a matter of formulation. But, but anyway, rhinoceros is a bit more robust in, in that regard. Uh, okay, and then uh, let me point this out too, maybe we'll, and then we'll look for questions, is um, there are times in the book when they're not exactly equivalent because I felt that in concept, they probably should work a little differently. So if, here's a very good example. Uh, in this case, basically what we're doing is we're building this jet engine casing using um, an adaptive component formulation. And basically it's built off these three profiles. Well, these three profiles will, were built inside of Revit. So basically you're selecting these three profiles out of Revit using Dynamo and then building the casing using the, um, using the form by loft cross-section node in Dynamo. Well, I felt you could do that with Grasshopper, but maybe in this case, these profiles are not built in Revit, but they're built in Rhinoceros. So that way you have the ability to use Rhinoceros and build more complicated shapes, or if you're more comfortable using Rhinoceros and building these profiles, then basically this is how you would select that information out and then you would then build it. So, so in that regard, sometimes the book is not a one-to-one -one exact, but what would make sense in certain cases, right? So I just thought I'd, I'd kind of point that out too, because you do, have the, you do have the ability to use the entire rhinoceros geometry kernel. Uh, that's also at your disposal. So if you are a person or know somebody who's more, more comfortable modeling inside of rhinoceros, then you have the ability to um, interact with it with, with Grasshopper uh, yeah, for Revit. Okay. Uh, and then there's some blank pages here of things I got to do. So what are we up to 100? We're up to 150? Okay. We're up to about with there, yeah. Yeah, we're going to end up with about maybe 250 when we're all done. Um, nice. Okay. Uh, Carl, could I step to the text one really quick and then we'll call it quits? I think so. And, and as you're stepping there, um, one of the big questions that, that we keep getting is obviously – uh, when and where will the book be available? I know you said there's still some work to do, but uh, can you tell the, the listeners where they can go to keep checking for when, when they can get a hold of it? Is the Simply Complex website yeah. the best spot? It, it is. It's, it's the best spot right now. Simplycomplex.org, the reference manual, and it'll be here. Check for updates. We'll, all, we'll be here and check for any updates. Uh, I have a lot of plans for where it's going to be, but just for right now, this is, this is the, where the where they get the latest update information would be. Hey, Carl, you know what I can do? Maybe we, we put a little thing here that says uh, sign up for updates, yeah? And you'll get a little email ping. We'll do that too, uh, uh, just thought of that. So then, because, uh, because I, I plan to, um, uh, the funny story is quite honestly, is I've talked to, a, I'm gonna have to self publish this thing because I talked with a bunch of publishers already and uh, you fill out these forms. And one of the first questions they asked is what percentage of your book are pictures? And I said, 100%. <laughs> so all of them have come back to me and said, we are not publishing a picture book. There's no way we're <laughs> going to do that. No way. So, so, uh, so I found out even trying yeah. to explain that this, because part of the, because the, the, the premise of the book is, is not just a reference manual, but it's in this cheat sheet format. Yeah. yeah. So it's just these one page summaries of examples. And I, I'm going to stick to the one page. Uh, as far as, as long as I can so far, I've been able to do it. Um, but, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, so I'm getting a little resistance there, but anyway, so I'm self publishing this and it's going to go out to, to different places. Uh, and so um, I, I haven't quite solidified where it'll be available and in what locations, but I'm thinking a few spots, um, you know, some pay sites as well as maybe some content management sites that you can search through the books, search through the data sets, you know, you can do all that kind of stuff. Anyway, that's still kind of ongoing conversations. But if anybody has any ideas for me, I, I would love to hear them about where we could do this. But anyway, it's, it is a picture book, Carl. It officially <laughs> is a picture book for AEC. <laughs> I think it's a little more than that, but I, I love that. Your next challenge is to use either Grasshopper or Dynamo or a combination to make a pop-up book version of it. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. <laughs> so the next great. time you're at, at, a, at a live conference, you pass around, you open it up, and the graph pops up. That would be awesome, Coral. I love it. Okay, so let's close with this uh, concept here. Is, uh, what if you don't have the functionality with Grasshopper inside? 
or Grasshopper for Revit. I'm wondering if it should be Grasshopper for Revit or Grasshopper inside Revit. I need to check with McNeil if the word inside is yet uh, trademarked. But anyway, uh, so we got Grasshopper here. Um, basically, if you look through all the components, nothing in here um, deals with text. So if we're talking about, say, a text note, uh, let me go to my annotation. And if we go to a text note, and we want to we want to actually change this text note to say uppercase, right? Um, okay. So uh, the reason I want to mention this, and I, I mention this kind of stuff, is that um, you do have the ability to change to uppercase with a text note now using these, but you can't do it on multiple ones. So let's say you wanted to do it on all three of these or your entire project or whatever, all your general notes if you're a structural engineer, uh, whatever it is. Um, if you look through all the parameters of a text note through the instance and the type, nowhere does it show the text. So you don't have the ability with out of the box to get or set the parameter, which is the text. Okay. So in this case, you would need to take it into your own hands to make your own cust what we call a custom node or uh, and there's many ways to do this, but kind of the easiest way to do this, and I'll just show you with the screen, we don't have to do a lot of hand waving, is, um, is basically you make your own. I changed it, Carl. Oh, here we go. Okay. So basically what you do is you put down this thing called a C-sharp script node, okay? You're allowed to name the input port. You're allowed to name the output port. What you do is you basically add in, um, you load in some references and then you add, it's in the description here, and then you add in these using statements. And then basically in here, you can code your own um, node that touches the Revit database. So in this case, basically what we're doing is you see this in Revit element that's right there. It basically is what we call an object. If you're not a C-sharp programmer, it's okay. Uh, don't worry about it. You, you can kind of follow what I'm saying anyway. This is basically a method. These are parameters not parameters of a Revit, but anyway, they all come in as objects. So you have to tell it, this is what you are. It's something called casting. So I just casted this as a text element. I said, you are a text element when you come in. And then basically I use the most powerful object in coding, at least C sharp coding, which is the period. And then I say dot text, which means get your text out of, get the text out of you, like, you know, extract it. And that's it, it's just text. You set that equal to the output port, text equals this casted thing, dot text, boom, it sends it right out, wham, text from text node, that's what that is, okay? So you just use this little code, or you can copy paste it, whatever, and then you're able to actually get the text. Now, if you wanna set the text, that's a little more difficult, not nah, a little more difficult, it just basically, you basically take the text note and then you set it to another uh, the tech, the new text that's coming in. And the only difference is since you're changing the Revit database, you have to wrap that darn thing in what we call a transaction. Um, so you basically change the transaction and then there you go. So that's basically how you get and set um, text from a text note without having a get and set text node in Grasshopper out of the box. So not too bad, right? This is just kind of the start. Uh, Carl, what I'm doing now, as you, as you, as we think, is um, towards the end of the book, I actually have about 20 pages that goes through um, zero touch in the kind of section here where you make equivalent. When I get there, oh man, I got a lot of work to do. Carl, uh, is where are you? Here we are. I made it. I made it. Okay, so uh, basically. <laughs> Oh, that's my age. Oh, he smokes. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I have towards the end of the book, um, basically how to make your own custom Dynamo node. In this case, this extracts the category of an object. I'm going to make equivalent ones for Grasshopper uh, here that would be, be very similar. You know, um, this uses a concept called C sharp. Uh, Grasshopper uses something called component, um, and then you just make your own custom component. Then when it's all said and done, um, kind of like loading in your own custom node. Uh, basically, it will show up in Grasshopper um, at the top of your, where are we here? I'm here, uh, here. 
it would show up up here as one of your custom nodes or a, or, or a custom package would be its own ribbon and then and so on. So for my simply comp, my comp, my simplex package, I've got a few things here. I've got word, I've got RAM, I've got some animals, you know, and so on. You can populate it through that. Okay, Carl, I think that's probably a good place to slow down. Well, it, you, you've certainly uh, tossed out a, a ton of information. That's for sure. I did. I think you're probably going to most <laughs> are probably going to need to listen to this afterwards. <laughs> well, it, uh, certainly, if any of the uh, the viewers out there have have a question, now's the time to put it into the the Q and A panel or the chat panel. Uh, what the heck, we're flexible here, just like uh, Grasshopper. Um, so throw it in there, and we'll make sure that it, that it gets answered. And while I'm giving uh, the attendees time to warm up their typing fingers for questions, we saw you were showing us with the text option working with C-sharp inside of Grasshopper. Um, do they have, in, inside of Dynamo, we can do that with zero touch, but not that way. We have an, a Python scripting node inside of Dynamo, right. but not, not a C-sharp scripting node, which would be awesome if we did. Okay. Is there a Python equivalent yes. inside of Grasshopper as well? There is, there is, there is a Python equivalent. In fact, it's, uh, absolutely, there is a Python equivalent, yes. So this, I'm getting a, uh, my computer's heating up fast, so if I blow up here, then you'll know. Um, py Python, let's see. Uh, okay, so C Sharp. C Sharp is this one. Uh, there is a Python one, yes. There's a Python one as well. Uh, whoops. <laughs> there is a Python one as well. Uh, so, yes, totally. Could do that, yeah. If you're a Python person, you could use Python. Or if you're a C-sharp person, you can use C-sharp. Yeah, in fact, uh, Python was, is actually a bit more in your face because there's actually a Python button right on the ribbon in Revit right there. Um, so that's yeah, there's a there as well. Um, and then I, I wanna warn everybody here while I'm thinking about it. From here over is kind of um, remnant stuff, so ignore that. These have these samples, but they don't really mean a lot to you, and you'd probably spend way too much time trying to digest what they do in terms of just starting from scratch. So, uh, you know, don't, you wouldn't need to spend too much time absorbing what's over here, because this is kind of like when this technology first came out and trying to get people used to it, but anyway. Does that answer your question? That does answer my question. I know that um, the, and I'm blanking on the name of it. I think it's just Python inside of Revit is what it's called. Um, but they've, they've made an add-in, which you can add and get that Python functionality directly inside of Revit. And it's based off of the fact that Python is so in your face inside of Grasshopper. Yeah, That's where they yeah, got the idea. I, yeah. In fact, um, Asan, uh, he does PyRevit. Um, he does have also, an add-in for Grasshopper that also um, allows you to run um, uh, and Revit that uses the Rhino inside Revit technology that allows you to run um, the editor and the script within Revit but you, um, for Grasshopper for Revit. I know I didn't explain that right, but there's an equivalent one <laughs> on the other side of the fence <laughs> where the grass is uh, greener. I don't know. I don't know if the grass is greener on the, on the dynamo. I think it's just a coincidence, Carl, that, uh, that the, that if anyone notices that the dynamo is in red and the grasshoppers in green, it's green for grasshopper. But I've had a few people tell me that, uh, that's the green grass is greener on the other side. I don't know if I'd quite say that, but you know, interpret that. <laughs> I didn't say this, but, um, I know a big part of dynamo is reading and writing to Excel. Uh, grasshopper has that ability out of the box as well. Uh, and so these are two nodes that actually can do that a read node and a write node. Um, and then of course there's add-ins uh, that can, you know, make that improvement even much better, but it does, you can read and write to Excel from, from Grasshopper for Revit. Uh, that is, that is available to you. I, I just happened to see this. Carl, we could, sp I could quite honestly spend, okay, so here's the thing. This book actually is set up as beginner, intermediate, advanced expert, and then special cases. Special case would be like touching other databases like ETABs and SAP, uh, structural analysis, Tecla, and so on. Uh, but uh, this is basically, uh, it was set up so that it could be a reference manual, but also a training manual as well. So if you're thinking of a training, you could use this you know, 
as, as training for either Grasshopper or Grasshopper Forever or Dynamo Forever. That's how it originally was set up. I'm kind of rethinking that concept. But anyway, um, this, in order for me to, to, in order for me to train this entire book, I guess both would probably take, gosh, two, maybe three solid weeks of training. So we're kind of jamming some of this into, uh, you know, an hour and a half. For sure. And, and while we've been sort of discussing that, we've had a couple questions come in. So uh, you got time for a couple questions, Marcelo? Oh, yes. Yep. Okay. I sure, I sure do. Uh, so the first, one, the first one coming all the way from Uruguay uh, mm. is wondering, is, it, is there a way to get a, uh, a skeletal mesh from Rhino into Revit to create beams? So basically you're creating your, um, well, basically what you're doing to set up your I'm going to say what they are thinking by skeletal mesh is like you're saying, setting up your, your framing diagram essentially inside of Rhino and then bringing that into Revit and making, turning it into beams and columns uh, by it. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I love, I think this is the favorite part of my, pre of my, of the, of the, this is my favorite part, by the way, um, answering these kind of questions, but yeah, let's just say, for example, we have a, a rhinoceros, file either you create it someone creates it whatever these are maybe two buildings or two objects or whatever and then between them you have structural framing i love the structural framing questions but you know maybe maybe this is the i guess that's a, a mesh what you mean by framing mesh is probably what you're talking about here um where's my near uh maybe i'm just going to draw this out okay carl draw it out Draw it up. I think this is actually the best part of the presentation. Okay. Oh, and look at that. Ha ha. Now that's <laughs> interesting. Oh my. Um, I, I'm going to go with that, Carl. Carl, I'm going with that. I like it. We are going with that. That is a architectural feature. Uh, okay. So let's say, <laughs> let's say this is your structural framing center lines that was laid out in concept. And now you need to bring that into Revit. Basically what you need to do is you need to take these center lines as a guide from Rhinoceros and build them into Revit. The answer is absolutely. Let's walk through it really quick. Um, so what you would do is you would take this Rhinoceros model and then you would open up, Re you would open up Revit. So here's Revit. Well, we're getting busy here with the, I don't know. I guess I should leave those in there. Uh, okay, so basically you would activate Grasshopper for Revit. I've got a lot of stuff in here. I'm going to delete. I'm going to delete some of that stuff. Okay, then basically what you would do is you need to select that rhinoceros geometry and get it to Grasshopper geometry so you can use this very special node called build, build, add beam. Hey, my computer is, uh, there we go. Okay, so this basically adds a beam in Revit. You feed it a curve, you define a type, which is what sizes the beam, and then the level at which you want to do the beam. So I think this is what the question is asking, right? So, so basically you need to feed in the curve. Well, this is a grasshopper curve, not a rhinoceros curve. So you need to get the rhinoceros geometry and the grasshopper, which is kind of easy peasy stuff. So basically you go to parameters, instead of going to the Revit tab, you go to the geometry tab that technically is rhinoceros geometry. And then you go to here called curve. Um, Grasshopper, if you're not familiar, works in these kind of containers and they're kind of multi-use, uh, but this is the curve container. So you can right click here and say select, set multiple curves. And then you come over to rhinoceros and then you can select these. And then it says up here, uh, select curve and you can hit space bar or enter. And now we have the curves. You basically feed the curves in here. The types, you could either do the selection type like we showed, or you can actually hard code it in here. So I could actually go to um, my, uh, my, my structural framing here. See how I'm hard coding? I'm just hard coding because uh, I showed you the other way to do it, right? Where you actually wire in the type through the filter. Here's hard coding it. And it looks like we only have one beam type in the actual model itself, but that's okay. So we'll select that. So basically the type is set and then we just need to feed in the curve. The level will default at zero if you don't do that and boom, that will build it. And then it says object, exp what? Okay. That should do it. That should do it. 
Oh, there we are. Yeah, yeah. look at that. And there and is the Revit framing from. Very cool. And as as you were doing that, uh, Leonardo got on here and he clarified my uh, my understanding of his question much better. And he said he was thinking more like something uh, like a geodesic dome, a geodesic dome, getting a little more fancy. Okay. 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 So, oh, so, okay. So, so here, here's the thing, and I wasn't going to get into it a whole lot, but what we're talking about now is the concept of interoperability, which I wasn't really going to focus on, but, but I, I got to tell you, I got to explain it now so that we understand. If you want to get information from Rhinoceros to Revit, you use Grasshopper as the conduit. Now, if you want to get it into Revit, you need, you can't just say bake. You have to make certain decisions. How do you want that geometry in Revit to manifest? Do you want it to be just dumb geometry so you can visualize it? Do you want to add a material to it? Do you want to be able to change it later? Do you want it to have it as a native Revit element? Uh, you know, and so on and so on. So you have to ask yourself these questions. A good start is this guide here, which is I'm still kind of working into the book, which is basically the four ways to get information from Rhinoceros into Revit. The first way basically is just a straight direct shape almost like an unintelligent blob, although the information will change as rhinoceros changes. So it is dynamically linked, but it just will just show you basically the geometry. I think it comes in as a default as a, as a generic model. Uh, the next one would be one where you can actually um, add a category and some material, uh, but it still is, is unintelligent in meaning that you couldn't select it and change it in Revit because it's controlled by rhinoceros. Um, a third way of doing it would be where you actually take the element, the rhinoceros element, and you stick it into a Revit family template. And then you let Grasshopper place the Revit family inside of Revit. That way it's more smart, it's more intelligent, it's actually part of a template, you get the parameters associated with it. Uh, and then the final way of doing it, I mean, whether you could argue this is the best way or if it's right for you, is where you're actually rebuilding it in Revit as in Revit likeness. So that's the concept we used in this case, which was we were rebuilding it in Revit's likeness. So we just had the lines. And so basically we used Grasshopper for Revit to rebuild it so that now these are technically Revit elements that's controlled by grasshopper now if for example you had something like this or like a geodesic dome or a or a, or a moose or or some crazy shape you have to ask yourself what's the best way to interpret this inside of revit that would be meaningful for me should i take this and put it into a template a a family template should i try to rebuild this in revit's likeness uh, as a actual Revit element. And then if you did that, like, let's say we wanted to build the, the moose in Revit. Okay. I'm going to pretend that's our geodesic dome because it's a random shape. Um, <laughs> well, Revit doesn't have the ability in Revit. If you look at Revit, right. If you look under structure and architecture, nowhere here does it say moose. Nowhere here does it say moose. And then it, nowhere here does it say geodesic dome and nowhere here does it say geodesic dome. So the question is, what are you trying to build? Are you trying to build the edges of a geodesic dome? Are you trying to build uh, the panels of a geodesic dome? Are you trying to build the foundation of a geodesic dome? So kind of like, what are you building? And if it's a generic shape that is not something that you couldn't manually build with Revit out of the box modeling tools, then you're not going to use this method number four, which builds Revit and geometry from native Revit elements, you would then move up to the other area, which would be, I don't know why it's not kicking my thing back on. You would use the, I got a lot of windows open here. Um, oh, here. <laughs> okay. Uh, you would use the other method, which would be probably this one, which would be uh, a very complicated shape, but inside of a family template. Maybe it would be a structural template or, or something like that. Yeah. So, so it, these are kind of decisions that you have to make as you move forward. And in fact, I found users 
using these all over the board. So for example, in this particular example that I showed, uh, by the way, you know what, let me get, by the way, we have a few minutes. Let me just, um, let me just, cause this column, I would like to see uh, this column. What would be nice is, um, where's my grasshopper? Here's my grasshopper. Okay, what would be nice is if I saw, I'm gonna show you how to convert geometry. So I'm gonna pick this Corinthian column. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back to grasshop, grasshopper. And then I'm gonna convert it. So I would go to Revit, I would go to Revit element, I would go to geometry. Okay, so this would actually convert the the Corinthian column to grasshopper geometry. So we can see it inside of Revit. Um, so let's say you needed that Corinthian column or geodesic dome or whatever, and you needed to convert that over to, um, you needed to convert that over to, uh, to Revit, uh, then you have, some thing, you have some options here. So uh, if we look at Rhino, then this should, there, there it is. There, there it is, you see it? It's right there, next to the moose. <laughs> see it right there next to the moose. We see it. Okay, so you have to kind of ask yourself what, if I'm gonna bring this into Revit, this Corinthian column, you're gonna bake it into Revit. Would you, would you try to build that in Revit's likeness or would you try to bring that into maybe a, a structural column family uh, template and then place it as a structural column or would you just put it in as a as a um, as a direct shape in a particular with a particular material and so on? So these are kind of the questions you have to ask yourself. But but if you're the, the thing is is the modeling tools within Rhinoceros are extremely robust and generic. So you'd be making these crazy shapes. I'm saying crazy crazy shapes. Dynamo can't make those shapes with just their with their native Revit element creation tools. So if that's the case, then you have to be a little creative about what you want to do. So anyway, I was trying to say this because, for example, for example, in this case, if I was going to bring this, all this geometry in, the whole thing, maybe this is a building with, uh, you know, some architectural features, right? Like the moose and the Corinthian column in this, this framing. <laughs> um, <laughs> then I needed to rebuild these buildings. These may be walls and floors. Well, what I would do is I would take these edges and I would build floors and I would take the top edge and build a roof. I would take this panel and I would build a wall, Revit walls. I would take these center lines and I'd build Revit beams. Then if I wanted to bring in this Corinthian column, I would put it into a Revit structural column template and then load it in that way. And then if I wanted to do the moose, I, I may, I may find a, I may use it as a direct shape and come up with a, a category to put it in. I don't know, maybe a cabin, like casework or something and put a material on it and then do that, <laughs> right? And then so that way each object, it's not globally putting it all in, but you're strategically making decisions, a smart decision on what is the future of this rhinoceros model? How is it gonna be changed? Is it gonna be changed? Who's gonna be working on it? What's the best way to take this geometry from here and put it into Revit? And then as Revit moves along and, gra and rhinoceros moves along, are you gonna always wanna have this dynamic handshake or do not, you know, so these decisions about like a geodesic dome or, or, a, or a complicated shape uh, really comes down to workflow. And so you basically, once you learn Grasshopper for Revit, you kind of learn its fundamentals. You kind of learn how to get things from Rhinoceros to Revit using those four methods. Or There are a few others, kind of caveats to those or variations. Then you can have smart decisions about how you want to do it in your office for workflow. Cause like, for example, if this, for example, if this was going to be used as a pursuit project to win a project with a, with a contractor, I wouldn't go through all that effort. I would just take everything and put it in as an unintelligent blob, maybe add some materials so that I can use it at Enscape for rendering. But if I was going to use this down the line to host things to maybe punch holes through the beams, uh, maybe use it in production for, for documentation, then I would have a very different way of baking this into to Revit. Um, so one more thing about that, because Rhinoceros is a very powerful 3D generic modeling program, you can argue that, when you bake it into Revit, Revit needs to know what it is. It's like, what is it? Well, and where do I put it? And how are you going to use it? So 
So those kind of, that extra dimension is added to Revit, which makes the baking part and the bringing in part uh, a very, very important, careful discussion that you have to have either with yourself or your colleagues. Does that answer that question? I think it does. And we've, we've got a couple more questions here. So I want to want to carry on, but um, okay. we got, we got thanks for the in-depth answer. Uh, they liked the idea about being able to do it as, you know, structural beams because then it's, it's usable inside of Revit. And they said they love the moose example. So, so all thumbs up there. Um, another question we had come through was, and you, maybe you've talked with the, the people at Neil, maybe you haven't. This but is an architectural feature, Carl. <laughs> Well, that's what it looks like. We've seen the moose hang on the wall, right? Um, the, the question from Andrew was, any idea when this comes out of beta? Uh, so if they were thinking about, if you were thinking about rolling it out to your office, are we weeks, months, years away? Ah, uh, very good question. Very good question. That is a very good question. I don't have an answer. I've asked McNeil and I haven't gotten a straight answer. I think this is what happened with the, with the development of it. Okay, let me back up, by the way. You can see the state it is in now, and it is in beta, but I wouldn't have that, I wouldn't allow that to prevent you from thinking about using it as a workflow in your office in controlled situations. I'm just gonna leave that there. You, you're, that's up to you. Um, I think what happened was McNeil decided to take Revit, uh, Rhinoceros, put it into Revit, and they didn't realize, they thought they were complete. This is just my kind of interpretation or almost complete. And then this technology blew up. And then all the Revit users said that, that wanted this technology said, this is great stuff. And then, and, then, uh, and then they realized it was a lot bigger than they thought. And so pushing it out as is wasn't acceptable. And so they have controlled groups. Uh, they talk to me once a month to get input on, on, on basically the state of of it, how stable it is. Um, and so I don't know when it's going to come out of beta. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you. I hear whispers that maybe uh, when it does come out of beta, there may be a small charge for the Rhino inside Revit added. Maybe, maybe not. I don't, I don't know. I can't speak to anything about that. Um, well, I, I, think, I, I think I can't, I can't. I don't have an answer. I couldn't even guess. I couldn't even say, uh, I couldn't even say next month. I couldn't say next year. Uh, I, I, th I think the way you answered it is good. I know when I first saw this, I was with you at the uh, uh, hackathon for built last year in Seattle and it kind of blew my mind and everybody there kind of really got into it. And like you say, it's kind of blown up from there. So I think they're just doing their due diligence. Um, but as we had that conversation, a couple more questions came in from Tim. Uh, the first one was uh, how about, external add-ins. So the one he is talking about is Conveyor, which is an add-in from uh, Proving Ground. So Nathan Miller, similar to Lunchbox. Let me, uh, uh, let me say, let sorry, me go let, ahead. Uh, let me answer that because that, that comes up. I wasn't, I wasn't going to, like I said, I wasn't going to focus on interoperability. Of course, that, that is where this ends up all the time, of course, um, because that, <laughs> that is one of the big reasons why you would use the Rhino inside Revit technology. Uh, but let me just say this. I got to get my, got to get into the zone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is one method to get rhinoceros elements into Revit using the Rhino inside Revit technology via Grasshopper. It is not the only way to do it. There are other technologies out there that do it. Um, so Rhino inside Revit was not the first to tackle the rhinoceros to Revit interoperability problem. It was not, but it's the first time that the rhinoceros company, which is McNeil, basically tried to solve it. So the rhinoceros inside Revit technology is uh, in a sense kind of raw. It allows you to do a lot of stuff in a lot of generic stuff because it exposes all of Grasshopper, all of Rhinoceros. The add-ins that you see here, which would be Conveyor, uh, Mantis Shrimp, uh, you know, um, Rhinomo, uh, which I think kind of morphed into Conveyor. I don't know all of them out there. They have very specific, very specific goals in mind for interoperability. And so, um, so I'm just gonna leave that there 
Uh, there are other options to use interoperability. It's not just Rhinoceros inside Revit. That's why I keep emphasizing over and over again that Rhinoceros inside Revit is not just about interoperability, um, but it certainly, uh, certainly could help solve your interoperability problems. Um, I also cannot be the person to compare the differences between what Rhino inside Revit could do for you with interoperability versus all the other add-ins that are out there. I cannot be that person to do that. And I wouldn't want to be the person to do that. I would say you kind of take that upon yourself to do that. Although I do know that some of the interoperability solutions out there do now use the Rhino inside Revit technology. So it's kind of like building a module off of this and then using it specifically for for um, for for interoperability, um, so just just kind of know that this Rhino inside Revit, Rhinoceros inside Revit, is a very revolutionary concept that allows you to do a lot of stuff. Because like if someone said, "What is Dynamo?" and you'd say, "Well, Dynamo helps you automate things in Revit." Well, it really is that is that all it does? Uh, no, <laughs> that's not all it does. Oh, okay, right. It's a similar thing. So uh, the Rhino inside Revit technology definitely does a lot more. And one more thing I got to add, this Rhino inside concept is very new to AEC and very exciting. So it's not just for Revit. There's also a Rhino inside of Unity. There's a Rhino inside AutoCAD. So the idea of stripping down a program and sticking the whole darn thing inside of, a, inside of an AEC program is relatively new. I personally would like to see this concept grow. I would actually like to see a SketchUp inside Revit, I'd like to see, uh, you know, more of these concepts come up and more of these like technology be developed by, by other, you know, uh, software companies, because it's, 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 it gives you a lot of flexibility to do a lot of things. Um, there, there's, there's my answer. That's my well, answer. I, I, I think it's a good answer. And just to, to quickly tag on that, I think it drives back to something I mentioned earlier about the idea of, uh, you, you work with what you have. So conveyor is, is, is a paid tool that gives you interoperability between Revit and, and Rhino. That's, it, it's a paid tool. If you have access to, to Rhino, which gives you access to Grasshopper, which then gives you access to Rhino inside of Revit, maybe that's your way to go. And as you mentioned, there's custom packages out there that give you access uh, with Rhino geometry through Dynamo into Revit with uh, Mantis Shrimp and Rhinomo. So, Absolutely. There's, there's lots of ways with which we can spread that information around. Yeah. And I don't see why you place. really in theory couldn't use more than one. Uh, I mean, I just, if you were a fan of conveyor, I don't see why you couldn't get conveyor and then use, use Rhino inside Revit to fill the gaps that, 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 that doesn't, you know, I just, I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't see anyway. I don't. I don't absolutely. This, I, mean, I get that question a lot. You, but you I use mean, the, the best tool for the job. Does it, he does an awesome job with what he does. And I think he does a great job. I just think, uh, you know, it's, it's, this technology is so broad that it's a good idea to kind of explore all its, all, its, uh, all its potential. Because quite honestly, what happens with Rhino inside Revit is each user has a different use for it. And, and actually, quite honestly, I got in trouble in my company when I started bragging about this. I would actually, I work for a structural engineering company, and I was telling all our clients, which are architects, this new technology. I was helping them solve their problems. Like, they absolutely loved it. Like in terms of like interoperability, they have these controlled Revit models. They need to get in into Revit. You know, we came with all these solutions. When I started preaching this technology internally in my company, it was a whole different. It was it was very different. Used completely differently. Tiny little portion of what I was talking about, and it was kind of uh, the philosophy of the, using it the way the, the architects used it didn't work in our office, and and it quite honestly didn't get off the ground as easily as I would have thought. So. Uh, anyway, it's just the idea here. It's now we've since corrected course. But anyway, the idea here is that everybody will use this technology differently. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's rather exciting uh, because we're just at, the, at its infancy. And so if you could get this, get this technology and try it out, then get it on your resume. And I think just, just to close out that interoperability uh, discussion, Tim just added a little comment saying here that they've been, he's been very successful converting things into native Revit geometry, even complex things that required adaptive components with conveyors. So, so there you go. There's, there's a, a use case for a more complex tool, more complex shapes. Sure. Conveyor, check it out. And of course, as just as we're getting ready to wrap, we get the, uh, Gavin Crump coming in with a question, the, the Aussie BIM guru. So, uh, ah, what is it? What does he got to say? He, 
whilst uh, I'm all for inside projects, I do usually have to encourage people to practice their Revit skills as well. Uh, sometimes there are solutions inside the box that get overlooked in place of uh, importing dumping direct shapes. Uh, He's thanking you for the great information, the project. And I, I, I will certainly let you answer this, Marcelo, but I tend to agree that sometimes we get excited with shiny things and other tools that maybe we don't uh, look at what's inside the box. And I think you mentioned this earlier with the, the out-of-the-box stuff in Grasshopper and in Dynamo without going with the custom components and custom packages, trying to get my nomenclature right. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you said it. I mean, I quite, yeah, I mean, it, that, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, here's a good example, right? Like, like is, do you need, do you need rhinoceros to build a rhinoceros? Well, this rhinoceros was built, was built inside of Revit using native Revit tools, using adaptive components, profiles, and, and reference points. This was a rhino, white, southern white rhino built inside of Revit. So, um, if you, so, I mean, I'm going to take that a step further. Definitely look at what tools are inside of Revit and then find out what you're more comfortable with. If you are more comfortable building a rhinoceros inside of rhinoceros, then build a rhinoceros inside of rhinoceros. If you're more comfortable with building a rhinoceros inside of Revit, then build a rhinoceros inside of Revit. Uh, I'm not an ad. I, I always mention this as we close out, Carl. I'm not an advocate that Revit can't do certain things that rhinoceros could do, at least from a modeling standpoint. I mean, anyone on the planet would know that. I mean, if anyone on the planet would be, would know that it'd be <laughs> me because, uh, you know, I've done some extremely crazy shapes, organic shapes inside of Revit, right? So uh, this is just one more example. So, so uh, I'm not saying you have to use rhinoceros to uh, model something that Revit can't model. No, uh, I totally agree with, uh, with the uh, BIM guru there is that uh, you, know, you could look internally within Revit, especially because I'm talking to Dynamo users. If you're talking to Dynamo users, look internally what Dynamo and Revit could do and then explore externally if, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what Rhinoceros and Grasshopper can do for you. Uh, you know, and then go from, go from there. That's a good comment. I'm glad, I'm glad I brought this up because I, I forgot to bring this up, Carl. I think it's a it's a perfect way to end the session. Um, I, I think I, I will take this this chance to say on behalf of everyone from the Dynamics of Calgary and Edmonton, thank you very much for taking your time to uh, share this new technology and present with us, Marcelo. Uh, it's it's been a blast. And uh, did you have any closing words before we uh, we close up shop and and go grab a bite to eat? Ah, uh, no other than uh, uh, stay safe and. Uh... Good luck uh, looking into this technology and we will see you next time. Perfect. That? That's awesome way to close it. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, we, we'll end me. the meeting now. We'll uh, have the recording up on the DOC YouTube channel in the next day or so. And uh, with that, we wish everyone a good night and we say thank you. Thank you.